वेलकम टू ईपीजी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर शायंतोनी पाल एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ एंशंट इंडियन हिस्ट्री एंड कल्चर यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ कैलकाटा टुडे आवर सब्जेक्ट इज इंडियन कल्चर द पेपर इज ऑन इंडियन पॉलिटी एंड टुडे वी शैल स्टडी ऑन द पॉलिटी एंड द एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन अंडर द गुप्तस हियर आर आवर लर्निंग ऑब्जेक्टिव फर्स्ट वी शैल स्टाडी द सोर्सेस from which we can reconstruct a picture regarding the polity and the administration of the guptas then we shall study the polity and under the polity we shall study the theories of kingship written during the period of the guptas and how the king has been represented in this text and also in inscriptions as a divinity which is very important to uh, strengthen the power of the king then we shall study about the ministers and the other functionaries involved involved in the administration then we shall study the forms of government the subordinates under the guptas and the type of relationship the guptas had with the subordinates then shall we then we will move on to the provincial administration then we shall study the status of the feudatories as reflected in the inscriptions of the guptas then we will study the dues of the state the judicial system and then we will conclude our lecture to begin with the guptas established a steady rule in a major part of northern india from 319 to 20 to 550 ce now this date 319 20 this is the beginning of the gupta era and it has been recorded in their inscriptions all of which are dated in the gupta era now by north india major part of northern india we mean that they had their capital in pataliputra which is in south bihar and they probably covered ma the major portion in their kingdom was uh, comprised the present areas of uttar pradesh and uh, bihar and also the outlying areas were ruled by their feudatories who were probably under their control now they continued the traditional model of bureaucratic administration retaining the nomenclature of the dignitaries of the mauryan administration now as we already know that the mauryan administration was the first of its kind which has been regarded a completely bureaucratic administration the details of this administration we find in the arthashastra of kautilya which was belongs probably belongs to the contemporary period and there we find the structure of the mauryan administration with a number of officials who should be involved in the administration however with regard to the ideology of kingship and organization of administration the changes may be noticed during the guptas uh, since the guptas are removed uh, almost by 300 years from the period of the mauryas since the mauryas ruled in the 3rd century bc and the guptas began began their rule in 4th century ad so there is a long gap of time so there are many changes can be noticed in the administration of the guptas as from that of the mauryas the power of the king was further strengthened from the mauryan period and in the gupta period the king was supported by the brahmanas to gain more and more power and exercise control and authority over the subjects under the guptas the subordinates and the local rulers controlled the outlying areas the out by outlying areas we referred to the areas outside uttar pradesh and bihar that were difficult to maintain as for example the areas in gujarat or the areas in the northern part of the present bengal delta comprising west bengal and bangladesh these are the outlying areas or in orissa so these are the outlying areas uh, which were probably controlled by their feudatories because it was very difficult to maintain control over these areas from their capital at pataliputra in south bihar thus under the guptas an elaborate organization of the provincial administration may be noticed this is the first of its kind since we do not get a separate branch of provincial administration during the mauryas the local people obviously had a significant representation in it this is also a very important feature of the gupta administration that is the involvement of the local people now the sources for the study of the gupta administration the administration of the guptas can be studied on the basis of their inscriptions they refer to various ranks of officers the administrative units the tax names etc the land grants of their subordinates 
with reference to their names and sometimes also without the names we have the um, inscriptions issued by the subordinates of the guptas but how do we know that they were issued by the subordinates of the guptas that because they were all dated in the gupta era so we think that these were probably issued by the subordinates of the guptas who however wanted to assume more and more authority and so probably they did not name their Gupta overlord always but still they used the Gupta era in their inscription. The account of Fa Jin who came, dear, he is a Chinese pilgrim who visited India. All the Chinese pilgrims probably came to India to study in the monasteries and to copy the Buddhist text to bring to their own country. So Fa Jin also came during probably during the rule of Chandragupta the second though Fa Jian is not at all concerned with the political matters, even he does not name the contemporary ruler, the Gupta ruler that is Chandragupta the second, still he records the life of the common people from which we can get uh, some information regarding the life of the people in the Gupta period. The Narada, Brihaspati and Katyayana Smriti contain discussion on polity. Now these Smriti texts are very important for a discussion on the polity during the Guptas. These are the major Smriti texts which were also called the Dharma Shastras which were probably completed during the Gupta period. So they contain a lot of discussion over the polity under the Guptas. In this Smriti text, the most important change that we notice is the growth of the power of the king as depicted in this text. We call these texts the normative texts. Why normative? Because these texts, earlier these texts used to be called by the scholars the law books because they thought most probably by the European scholars who studied about, about our country. They called these texts as law books but these were not, not actually law books because these were not law these are actually some norms which are set by the writers of the dharma shastras now who were the writers of the dharma shastras the names of narada brihaspati katayano have, have come down to us but most probably single a single smriti text was not composed by a single author these were composed by several author from time to time but all of them were probably brahmanas so these brahmanas being the uh, leaders of the society they have set they have laid down certain norms which were to be followed but as we know that the law is not always it is, it is not necessary to follow the law in the society so there are some deviations from these normative texts brihaspati says that in a kingless country the occupation of agriculture trade and money lending do not exist the king was thus created as the leader of the social order narada even goes to the extent of asking the subjects to abide by the king's command whether right or wrong and to honor him even though he should be wordless so please see that even when the king is wordless the lawgivers or the writers of the normative texts instruct the people that they should follow him even a wordless king should be followed so this is the norm set by the authorities in the dharma shastras these data indicate that the power of the king reached its zenith in the gupta period how with the help of these brahmana authors of the dharma shastras the rulers had full support from the priestly community to exercise his power over the subjects because he had the full backup with the writers of the normative texts now narada further says that the king should protect all orders according to dharma now dharma is very important in ancient indian culture and polity this dharma is does not refer to any particular sect like the buddhist the jainas no particular sect this dharma is the right way the righteous path what is the righteous path as has been upheld by the writers of this normative text that what should what is right so this is the dharma it, it does not refer to any particular sect so narada says that the king should protect all orders according to dharma and would receive his share of agricultural produce as his vetana or salary for the protection of the people so there is a contract between the king and his subjects that the king should protect the subjects and in return the subjects should uh, submit a share of their produce to the king.
now what was the uh, reaction what was the response of the people to these types of uh, norms set by the lawgivers in the kadambari of banavatta a uh, slightly this is a slightly later account which belongs to the beginning of the 7th century a wise minister tells a young prince that some kings being deceived by more than mortal praise by cunning men considered themselves to be derived from divine particles and tried to act as divine being thus they become ridicule the people so see how people reacted how the writers the authors reacted to these norms set up by the brahmana authors for the king and to the subjects now here are some titles assumed by the gupta kings the gupta kings took exalted imperial titles like maharaja dhiraj parameshwara parama bhattaraka what are the meanings maharaja dhiraj obviously mean the great king of kings the supreme lord the parameshwara the parama bhattaraka all these are very high sounding very exalted titles so these were assumed by the gupta kings now this maharaja dhiraj this title in sanskrit was most probably derived from the greek title used by the indo greek kings what is that that is basileos basileon the king of kings so this was sanskritized this greek title was sanskritized and it was converted into maharaja dhiraj which was used by the gupta kings and it was very important because all the later king usually assume this high sound sounding title even the local rulers we find in the post gupta period they assume these high sounding titles like maharaja dhiraj parameshwara parama bhattaraka so we can say that guptas probably set up the model that what title should be used by the king these titles and some other descriptive epithets appear on the coins and inscriptions as we will see now here are the gold coins the unique and very beautiful gold coins of the guptas on the upper left side you can see one coin this is called the archer type of coin where the king is uh, carries a bow and he uh, on the other hand he has an arrow and so the here the king represents himself as an archer on the reverse you can see the goddess with a cornucopia and a noose in his both hands and what is the epithet used here on the reverse side of the coin that is apratiratha apratiratha means invincible so here the king says that he is invincible also below in the left uh, lower left side uh, lower right side of the uh, slide you can see another gold coin issued by samudra gupta and here he uses the same archer type uh, sorry this is a standard type of coin where the king holds the scepter as we have already discussed the, the, that the scepter is the symbol of the danda which is which is the practically the right of the king to hold the danda and here samudra gupta uses the title sarva rajachitta which means the exterminator of all kings so the gupta kings apart from using this high sounding titles like maharaja dhiraj parameshwara parama bhattaraka they also this use this high sounding epithets like apratiratha sarva rajachitta etc the ilahabad pillar inscription is a very important inscription in the history of the guptas since it was engraved during the period of samudra gupta and it largely discusses his conquest in throughout india so there we find the view that the king is a divine being and he has been proclaimed in the elahabad pillar inscription as a lokodhamna deva harishena the court poet who actually composed this prashasti he describes samudra gupta as lokodhamna deva what is lokodhamna deva deva means he is a god and lokodhamna he dwells on earth so harishena regards samudra gupta as a god dwelling on earth so the king is not at all a human being but he is actually a god who resides in this earth in the form of a human being and he was further made equal to the gods like dhanada dhanada is the who is kuvera varuna indra and antaka so here harishena wants to say the king is equal to god or rather the king himself is god who is only lives in this world as a human being here is the elahabad pillar inscription on the left, left side you can see the pillar this is actually an ashokan pillar on which you will find the inscription of ashoka 
and Samudragupta chose this very pillar to inscribe his inscription. Why he did so? The scholars had many views regarding it. Probably Samudragupta wanted to represent himself as a king like Ashoka. So he chose to in inscribe his inscription on an Ashokan pillar just below the inscription of Ashoka. On the right side, you, you will find a real picture of the Allahabad of the A stampage taken from the Allahabad pillar inscription. This is a very important inscription of the period of the Guptas. Now the Yuvarajas and the Kumaras. The king was helped by the crown prince. He is also called Yuvaraja or Yuva Maharaja who was next to the king in rank. They were again distinct from the Kumaras. Who were the Kumaras? The Kumaras were all princes of royal blood. The king had several queen, queens. So there were several Kumaras who were sometimes entrusted with the duty of administering the provinces. The, so the Kumaras were very important in administration. The Allahabad pillar inscription refers to the nomination of the Samudra Gupta to the throne by his father Chandragupta the first in the following words. What does Chandragupta the first say? Come on, he says to Samudra Gupta, come on, O worthy one, and embracing him with hair standing on end and indicating his feeling, his father perceiving him with the eye, overcome with affection and laden with tears of joy, but discerning the true state of things, said to him, so protect the whole earth. While he was being looked up with sad faces by others of equal birth. Who were the others of equal birth? They has been described as the Tulya Kulajas. So most probably there were many claimants to the throne. And amongst them, from amongst them, probably Chandragupta the first chose only Samudragupta to be his successor while the courtiers were breathing cheerfully. While the, why they were breathing cheerfully? Because the new king will now take over. He will now ascend the throne. So they were very happy. So this uh, description of the nomination of Samudragupta to the throne by his father Chandragupta the first probably indicates that the law of primogeniture. What is the law of primogeniture? That the eldest uh, son will always become the king. This was not probably followed always in all cases because here in this case in the Allahabad pillar inscription we can clearly see a case where the next king was chosen had been chosen by the his father. Now we shall study something about the ministers they were called the Amatyas and the Sachivas. The Amatyas, Mantrins and Sachivas were the actual persons responsible for the smooth running of the administration. Whether there was a regular council of ministers is not certain because as we have already discussed that in this period we don't, do not have any text like the Arthashastra to discuss about, about the administration. We have mostly some inscriptions and some normative texts from where we get some data regarding the administration of the Guptas. Now Katyayana favors the appointment of the Brahmanas in the post of Amattas. We do not know whether this norm was strictly followed during the administration during the period of the Guptas but this is the norm set by Katyayana that the Brahmanas should be appointed in the post of the Amatyas. The post of the high ranking officers were generally hereditary as for example Sikhara Swamin and Prithvi Sena, the father and the son, served Chandragupta II and Kumaragupta respectively. Similarly, Parnadatta and his son Chakrapalita served as provincial authorities in Shurashtra during the reign of Skandagupta. We have several other cases where we find that the son is succeeding the father in his post. The other administrative ranks. The Pratihara. The Pratihara was the doorkeeper or rather he was the palace guard. The Danda Nayaka. Danda has, again has some association with the rod, the law of punishment. So the Danda Nayaka was either a military commander or a judicial officer. The Ashwapati and the Pilupati. Pilu means elephant. The Ashwapati and the Pilupati were in charge of the horses and elephants. The Senapati was the commander of the army. But the Senapati had some other works to do which we shall see later. Another new designation of high rank noted in the Gupta period in particular was that of the Sandhi Vigrahika. He was the minister for peace and war. He was very important. The Danda Pashika was in charge of the administration of justice. 
the chaurat dharanika which is very interesting the chaurat dharanika was entrusted with the duty of catching thieves the charters and bhattas were regular and irregular troops they used to be prohibited from entering the gift land granted to the brahmanas or religious institutions it is all it also indicates that the charters and bhattas were probably entrusted with local policing a new element as we can find in the administration of the guptas is hierarchy which is not at all present in the administration of the mauryas there is an increasing tendency of hierarchization of officers ranavir chakraborty points to the use of prefixes maha and sarva before their name thus we get reference to the dandanayaka the maha dandanayaka the sarva dandanayaka and the maha sarva dandanayaka obviously as this prefixes would suggest that the dandanayaka was powerful but from him the maha dandanayaka was more powerful the sarva dandanayaka was further more powerful and the maha sarva dandanayaka was obviously the most powerful among all these ranks of dandanayakas they were sandhi vigrahika and maha sandhi vigrahika pratihara and maha pratihara and so on now the ilahabad pillar inscription points to an interesting case of one person who is that person he is harishena he held several important offices this harishena the poet composer of the prashasti was a kumaramatya who were the kumaramatyas as we have already discussed that they were probably princes of royal blood or they may not at all belong to the royal family but they were entrusted with the local administration he was again a sandhi vigrahika that is he was again a minister for peace and war which is a very important post and he was again a maha dandanayaka that is he was associated with the army probably it is for this reason that the ilahabad pillar inscription contains such a detail and vivid description of the conquest of samudragupta throughout the whole of india the forms of polity or the forms of government monarchy was the common form of polity the other form of polity that of gana sanghas continued to exist till the gupta period who are the gana sanghas the gana sanghas were ruled by the gana that is they were ruled collectively not by any single king there were no king in the gana sangha but there was a chief who was nominated by the others by the obviously by the or not by all belonging to the gana sangha but by the influential people and people used to obey him so this is the structure of the gana sangha polity however we find the reference to the gana sanghas as early as the 6th century bc during the period of the mahajanapadas but what happened to them during the gupta period the death knell of the gana form of polity was sounded by samudra gupta who swept away the gana sanghas like the malava arjunayana yudhavas and others in the panja so the gana sangha polity ended most probably during the gupta period and monarchy became the most predominant form of govern government or polity during the gupta period so this monarchical form of government became the most important now the subordinates the ilahabad prashasti refers to various ranks of subordinates who were subdued by samudra gupta apart from the kings of aryavarta and dakshinapatha who were completely defeated by him there were some pratyanta nripatis who were the pratyanta nripatis they are the frontier kings as well as the gana sanghas like the malava arjunayana yavdhava etc who paid him all kinds of taxes obeyed his commands and came in person to salute him in this manner they wanted to satisfy him there were atavika rajyas the atavika rajyas refer to the forest kingdom most probably belonging to central india whom he made to act like his servants there were again some extra indian rulers of the northwest and southeast asia who surrendered themselves to him offered their daughter for marriage to him and requested for using the gupta garuda seal for administering their own vishas and bhuktis the vishas and bhuktis refer to the districts and provinces the divisions of the gupta empire this indicates not only the authority and control samudra gupta exercised on the king subdued by him but also the differential status according accorded to all the subordinates by the king the status of the subordinates some of the subordinates like the parivrajaka maharajas 
of Baghel Khan region issued their land grants during the enjoyment of sovereignty by the Gupta emperors. So they refer to the Gupta emperors. Still, they did not name the Gupta emperors. And still, some there are some other subordinates who issued the land grants without any reference to the emperors but how do we know that they were subordinates to the guptas because all of them use the gupta era in their inscriptions so we regard them as the subordinates of the guptas so there were various ranks of subordinates of the guptas and to whom the guptas had uh, accorded various status now we move on to the provincial administration the linkage between the central and the provincial administration was maintained through the officers called the Kumaramatyas about whom we have already discussed and the Ayuktakas. The Kumaramatyas created by the Guptas from the body of the Amatyas were high officers, officers on the personal staff of the emperor as well as those in charge of the districts. The Ayuktas or Ayuktakas were entrusted with the job of restoring the wealth of the kings conquered by the emperor as recorded in the Allahabad Prashasti. They were also given charge of administration in provinces and districts. Provincial administration which was controlled by the central. How? The empire was divided into provinces called the Bhuktis or Deshas. They were administered by officers with the title Uparika. The Bhuktis were subdivided into districts called Vishayas and were administered by the Vishayapatis or the governors of the Vishaya. The Kumaramatyas or Ayuktakas often occupied this post. The charters from North Bengal. By North Bengal, here we mean the undivided Bengal of the pre-independence Bengal uh, comprising present northern part of West Bengal and northern part of the country of Bangladesh. So, the charters from North Bengal states that the Uparika Chirata Datta Pundravardhana Bhukti was serving under the feet of Emperor Parama Daivata Parama Bhattaraka Maharaja Dhiraja Kumaragupta. Chirata Datta in his turn appointed the Kumaramatya of Kotivarsha Vishal. So, what happened? The governor of the Bhukti, the larger unit, was appointing the governor of the Vishaya, the smaller unit. So, Chirata Datta appointed the Kumaramatti of Koti Varsha Vishaya. Thus, the emperor appointed the governor of the province, who in his turn appointed the governor of the di district. In this manner, the control from the central authority was maintained in the provincial and local administration. Now, the role of the local bodies in the Gupta administration, which is very important and this is a new element which we find only in the administration of the Guptas and not before in any one of the administration preceding them. The Dhanaidaho copper plate, Dhanaidaho is again in North Bengal of the 432-33 CE shows that the matter regarding the sale of land. All of the charters record the sale of land and the subsequent gift of land. So these are called the combined deeds of land sale and land donation. So this Dhanaidaho copper plate uh, re re records the, the matters regarding the sale of land according to the prevalent rate in the Khata Pada Vishaya was placed in front of the Gramashta Kuladhikarana. Who, uh, who were the Gramashta Kuladhikarana? It refers to the Ashta Kuladhikaranas, the most prominent eight families belonging to the Grama. Now, B.D. Chattapadha observes it was not an all comprehensive village body since different social groups of the village like the Kutumbins. Who were the Kutumbins? They were the wealthy class of agriculturists, the Brahmanas and the Mahattaras. The Mahattaras were again the elders of the village, not by age, but they were very influential in deciding the matters regarding the village. Now the Kutumbins, Brahmanas and Mahattaras figure separately in the inscription from the Adhikarana. So Bidhi Chattapadha suggests that the Gramashtakula Adhikarana was not an all com comprehensive village body. In another charter, there is reference to a Vithi Adhikarana. Vithi means a group of villages. Vithi Adhikarana refers to the uh, office of the Vithi. The Vithi could, could have contain, contained a group of villages and the Vithi Adhikarana probably brought about the administrative integration of a number of villages within it. It was headed by an Ayuktaka and his Adhikarana. Now, the urban character of the Adhishthana Adhikarana of Koti Varsha Vishaya. Koti Varsha Vishaya, the present Bangar area in the South Dinajpur district of West Bengal, this, the Adhikarana of this place had a very urban character. 
In the Damodarpur copper plate number 1 of AD 444, we find that the Adhish Karana, Adhish Thana means city and Adhish Thana Karana means the office of the city of the Vishaya of Kati Varsha. It was headed by the Kumaramatya. It had members from the mercantile community and different occupational groups. Who were they? They were the Nagara Sreshti or the guild president of the town, the Sarthavaha or the caravan trader, the Prathama Kulika or the chief artisan and the Prathama Kayastha or the chief scribe. That is to say, this office had a more urban character and its members were all from the non-agricultural groups. But please remember that these all these non-agriculturists were actually entrusted with the duty of deci deciding uh, which land should be uh, sold to the uh, applicant. Now, the Datta family has hereditary governors of Punravardhana. From 4444 to 543 CE, the Uparikas of Punravardhana assumed more independence and adopted the title Maharaja, which is very important because the Uparikas were actually provincial governors. Why they were assuming the title of Maharaja? Because the ma title Maharaja actually refers to the king. So, this indicates that the Uparikas were assuming more and more power and they were taking the title of Maharaja and they were probably comparing themselves with the king. The Damodarpur copper plate number 3 dated to 482 AD refers to Brahma Datta as Uparika Maharaja and in Damodarpur copper plate number 4 the Uparika Maharaja was Jayadatta. So you can notice that all the governors, all the Uparikas had the same name ending Datta. So most probably they belong to the same family. So they are called the Datta family, the governors of the Pundavardhana. Even they hereditarily occupied the position of the governor of the province. Finally, a member of the royal family. He is called Rajaputra Deva Bhattaraka. He was brought to that position in the last Damodarpur copper plate of 543 AD, soon after the Guptas were removed from power. It may be seen thus as the last attempt on the part of the Guptas to hold their authority in North Bengal when most of their territories in other parts of the country were lost. The different characters of the Adhikaranas at different places, which is again important. In AD 447, when Damodarpur copper plate number 2 was also issued, the Boigram copper plate shows that another Vishayadhikarana under Kumaramatya Kulavriddhi was fun functioning at Panchanagari. Thus, at the same time, we have two Kumaramattas who were governing at different parts of North Bengal. Now, Panchanagari is not exclusively mentioned as a part of Pundravardhana Bhukti. Vaigrama, that is present Vaigram, the place of the land grant, is present Bogra, a district in Bangladesh. Now, R.G. Boshak, who originally published this copper plate charters, he points out that the Kativarsha was perhaps a more important Vishaya where the government had to provide better administrative arrangement for the Vishayadhikarana than in Panchanagari, which may have been a newly formed district at the time. So, the absence of Adhishthanadhikarana with urban members, as we have already discussed, who were the urban members, the Nagara Sreshti, Sarthavaha, Prathama Kulika, Prathama Kayastha. So, the absence of Adhishthanadhikarana with urban members probably speaks of the rural character of the place of the land grant. The offices of different levels were organized. Some of the panchayat type called the Gramashtukul Adhikaranas, suitable for the rural areas with prominent residents of the villages at its, as its members like the Kutumbikas, the Mahattaras as we have already discussed. Some offices function at the Vithi level, preferably over a group of villages and the official control from upper tiers of administration was not exercised at Sringavera Vithi or at Panchanagari area to the extent to which it was exercised in Pundravardhana Bhukti. The Adhikaranas of other areas, Tira Kumara Matya Adhikarana, the office of the Kumara Matya of Tira. Now, Tira was a Bhukti in North Bihar. We get reference to this Adhikarana in the inscription of the Guptas. The Vaishalla Dhishtana Adhikarana, which is the city office of Vaishali, again in North Bihar. This indicates that district and municipal boards were also functioning in North Bihar like those in North Bengal. Now the dues of the state. Land revenue was the most important source of income to the state since it was an agrarian society. So land revenue was the most important source of income. 
Land revenue came from a variety of sources like direct tax on the land as well as a tax on the produce of the land. The charters instruct the residents of the gift land to pay bhaga, bhoga, kara, hiranya, etc. and other kinds of dues to the, to the doni. Bhaga was one sixth part of the grain share to be paid to the king. Bhoga was periodical offering. Kara is used in a general sense to indicate taxes. Hiranya is payments in kind. A significant change that had taken place was the increasing trend of paying salaries in land grants rather than in cash. Land grants usually gave the beneficiary hereditary rights over the land. Now the Brahmanas were usually granted tax-free lands. Land grants undermined the authority of the king, be creating and it led to the creation of independent pockets where the beneficiary's commands would be regarded as final. Still, the state surrendered it for the sake of maintaining control over the outlying areas. According to one explanation, by this manner, the state ensured its authority over the areas. It did not exercise effective control by creating a class of religious beneficiaries like the brahmanas and temples the establishment of the jati varna society over this pre-state pre areas was ensured the judicial system we do not get much detail regarding the judicial system the guptas had a fairly good judicial system at the bottom were various councils which were authorized to resolve disputes that arose examples of these were the village assembly or the trade guild the king presided over the highest court of appeal and he was assisted by various judges, ministers and priests etc. Their presence dependent on the nature of the case. The judgments were usually made based on the legal texts, the social customs or specific edicts from the king. Now we should conclude our lecture. The Guptas thus organized an elaborate administration throughout a major part of North India that served ideal for the subsequent rulers. As for example, we can see the application of this model of administration by a local group of rulers in the Faridpur area of present Bangladesh who adopted similar titles like the Gupta kings who also adopted the names of the units like the Bhuktis, like the Vishas. All these appear in the inscriptions of the local rulers from Faridpur district. So Guptas probably served, the administration of the Guptas probably served as a model for the subsequent rulers. In many cases, we find the adoption of titles like the Gupta kings, the division of the kingdom in units like the Guptas, the similar administrative designations uh, followed by the later rulers. However, the most striking feature of the Gupta administration appears to have been its ability to accommodate the local elements within itself. As we have already found that in the case of North Bengal, the Gramashtukuladhi Karana, the village body, was entrusted with the duty of regarding with the duty of deciding the matter regarding the land sale. So the local elements always play a very important role in the administration of the Guptas. This we do not find in the administration under the Mauryas. Thank you.